Hi, and thanks for joining us for the Envelope Lime screening series. I'm Robert Abley, a contributing writer for the Los Angeles Times. And today we'll be talking about the Norwegian film, The Worst Person in the World, which is up for two Academy Awards, Best International Feature and Best Original Screenplay. Joining us are the film's director, Joachim Trier, whose previous films, Reprise and Oslo, August 31st, make for an unofficial trilogy with Worst Person, and its luminous star, Renate Renzi. She plays Yuli, a vibrant, forthright woman approaching 30 who finds that discovering herself is a challenge that isn't as simple as choosing a career, being in a relationship, or not being in a relationship. The movie has had its own journey of discovery, debuting at Cannes last year with the Best Actress Award for Renate, collecting acclaim along the way, and now finding itself up for a pair of Oscars. So welcome, Joachim and Renate. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. First off, congratulations. It, it really is a, it's a, just a, a stunning film, and it has so much going on. It's like, it's like a feast. And um, I, But I want to say, like we always think of relationship movies as, as kind of being between two people. and um, this movie is about a woman's relationship with herself, and I'm kind of wondering, was that the original spark? Yeah, I think that's a very good point, that we felt that the, the sort of the romantic comedy that we're, I guess, making our own Scandinavian version of here, um, sometimes those films uh, become about finding the right partner. And we felt it was more interesting and intriguing to make a film about a young woman who's actually on a journey of self-discovery through that process of, of partnering up with first uh, a guy who's a little bit older and quite defined in his ways, and then afterwards with a younger guy who's maybe a freer spirit. But through the journey, we are trying to deal with themes much more of sort of um, time passing and identity and these things than just the romantic aspects of it, I guess. Why aren't there more movies like this? I mean, is that something you guys thought about when you were writing it, you and and um, and your writing partner? Es Eskil, yeah, I co-write with Eskil Fucht. Uh, we we've done five films together, actually. Um, yeah, I guess we, we, without sounding pretentious, we try to do the films that we want to see ourselves to a certain extent. The, uh, trying, in this case, to do something which is hopefully visual, we shoot on 35, something that's full of mood and place and emotionality and music. But at the same time, we also wanted to try to make a film that has a melancholic spirit to it about what we lose and how we grow from loss. So, uh, so I don't know if that was inspiring, but I have to mention something very important, which is that it's written for Renata Reinsvein because I had done, uh, she had a uh, two lines of dialogue in a, Film line. We, we thought it was one, but it turns out she ad-libbed something in the background. We've been corrected. She jumps in the pool and says, I have water in my nose. Two lines of dialogue. Uh, in a previous film called Oslo, August 31st, that we made 10 years ago. And I always want to work with Renata. So that was also part of the motivation to do this film, was to, to, was to work with her again. Uh, yeah, Renate, what is it like to have a, a, a role written for you? <laughs> I still get happy just hearing about it now, like you were talking about it. It's uh, It was really amazing. I was so nervous reading the script because I knew that he had written it with me in mind and I was scared of what, how do I look from the outside? Uh, but it's, of course, it's not about me. It's, uh, I, I felt really connected to the script, but it's really about, it's very universal. I think a lot of people uh, get a very personal, emotional uh, connection to the movie. Um, I, I'm wondering, is, is it is it freeing when you have so much to do in a movie, like when it's so much so reliant on what you do? Is, is there more pressure or is there less pressure? That's a very good question, because in some ways I feel it's easier because you get so involved and you're so inside the character. Uh, it can be harder to get in there just for a few days and uh doing your thing but um and and with the script too i feel that i could go infinite within the frames because it's uh, so many themes and it's so uh existential so i i feel in some ways it was very easy to just like dive in and and do 
whatever in this character, uh, but um, and be very free. But on the other side, of course, I was scared to death because it, it was my first lead. So very scared, <laughs> a lot of so, pressure. Well, you, Joachim, so how do you how do you make somebody feel uh, better about you know doing their first lead role? I mean, how, you know, it's kind of your job as a director, right, to to <laughs> to, to to help her do that. Well. The first thing I did was to call her the day after I told her she had the part. And as expected, Renata was kind of halfway happy and halfway freaking out. And I had to tell her again, listen, trust me, I, I know what I'm doing. I'm, I, I know that you're good. We've been together on set nine days for that other film. I, you know, I've seen Renata endlessly doing great work on the stage. I, I even had my friend Isabel Huppert, who I shot a film with a few years ago, when she was in Oslo, watched a, a stage play directed by Robert Wilson, and she came to me and she said, who's this remarkably talented uh, young woman, this actress? And I said, that's Renata Reinsway. I'm going to make a <laughs> film with her. So, I mean, I, I knew she was good, but I think it, it's, yeah, how, what do I do? I mean, I, I try to slowly have Renata try to erase the divide between the character as written and how she emotionally engages with it through a long process of rehearsal and talks and, and practical exercises to try to figure out the scenes that we're doing together. And, and at the end of that, usually, you know, like Renata takes charge of the character and can challenge me and say, you know, ah, I think she would do this instead of that. And I, I think that's a good place to be as a director, to let them go and, and let them be free in their work. Can I say something too that you do that is very important? <laughs> uh, okay. If there is room for it, because it's... Um, you also make this very collective culture on set. So it's not me going in doing my thing. It's us solving something together. So like the me or the actor or the like ego disappears because it's all of us solving the events or the scenes or uh, moments together. And that's really, that makes a lot of the fear go away too. It's really interesting because it, this this does seem like the kind of movie that you're having conversations like all the time about who Yuli is at any given moment and what's going on. I mean, it's kind of funny that you have that scene where she's where she's upset at Axel and she's like, "You always always analyze things, and I just want to feel." I mean, can you overanalyze Yuli on the set making it, or sometimes would you just let things be felt? Uh, that's a great uh -huh. question. Uh, yeah, I think that this film on a very personal note, is also uh, for me trying to reckon with uh, my past and who I am. And I think uh, I think honesty uh, builds trust between in the writing room with Eskil and with Renata and me. And like, I think that being someone who's a director and wants and feels I owe people control and definitions and intellectualizing things to explain them, I think it was very healthy to write some of those arguing conversations, some of those breakup scenes, and also reckoning with my own past. You know, like the fact that it's not always the defining power which makes something interesting in art or in life. Sometimes it's the humility and the vulnerability that actually makes something work. And and we had a lot of good conversations about that, Renat and I as well. Um, and I, yeah, I think that that's how we make movies. We try to be honest and personal and just really pray that it's going to be conveyed to others and work as a film. Do you want to speak to that, Renata, at all? Or? Yeah, I feel like we were we were building on top of each other, uh, like all, from all the conversation that we had and uh, especially that um, scene in we were... The, the, the breakup scene, we were all very uh, involved in that scene. I think everyone on set was really emotional after after that uh, that week of shooting. And uh, yeah, it uh, the line of her uh, saying uh, that she is uh, she feels like everything is overanalyzed and that she just needs to be in the chaos. It's very core of her and was a very important. Uh, line for me it's um it's yeah core for julie as a person she needs to that's what she needs to evolve to just let go and be in the chaos so she can figure out where she is 
It's, it, if I may add to that, it's interesting because I think we're at the core of a uh, work dynamic in that exact example. If, if, uh, I think that, I mean, that exact line is something that Renata ad-libbed mm -hmm. based on conversations that we had. And Eskil and I, when we write, we are not precious about the words we are most of what is said in the film is as it's written but on set i i feel since i'm also a co-writer i allow myself to say to the actors on my like now we do a take when you just say what you what you know what's underneath like say it explicitly see what comes up and and renata just came up with that and it fitted perfectly and it was one of those wonderful moments when you're as a co-writer director sitting there thinking like that's the perfect line to say right there i hope it it's going to survive in the edit, and it did because it, it's it spoke the truth of that moment. But but it, it that's like my ideal is that kind of collaboration when the actors are so involved in the thematics and the character that they can come up with the better line than I could have written. So there we are. <laughs> now, Joachim, uh, one thing that is kind of uh, a structure that's imposed on the movie is the, is the chapters, and and uh, which is you know it's really well done, like one of the best. It, examples of that I've seen and I and I felt like thank you you're, it was a way of, a way of, of the movie saying you know lives aren't whole they're not one thing they're many things it, 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 what was the what was the impetus behind that decision to make chapters I think it was it's the paradox again of it's liberating to have formal devices like having chapters uh, allows us to uh, omit things have ellipses jump in time so that we can cover this period of someone's life over several years actually as the as the story spans and and uh, it kind of making a contract with the audience that you know I wanted it to feel like a music album with hit songs you know each scene is a little story in itself almost but they all connect you know it's not complete fragmentation but to have that kind of moment to breathe between some of the very intense scenes I think was also a a kind of a, I hope, a respectful way of letting the audience fill in their interpretation, leaving space for for filling in the gaps. And we we watch the seasons in Norway change. You know, we we go from summer into winter, back into spring, and and between the chapters sometimes. And and it's a way of also showing that the time moves, making that apparent through the chapter divides. I think. Um, Renate, do do you, do you feel like? Well, I actually want to ask you, like, was there something that helped you get in the mindset of Yuli on set? I mean, uh, you know, like a piece of clothing, a piece of music. I mean, were there, do you have things like that that you, that you use as an actor? Yeah, I had a lot of music and we put on a lot of music on, uh, uh, like for the party scenes and this, the wedding scene where you te they test out uh, what is cheating and not. And we had... Uh, it was like a big party on set, wasn't it, Joachim? Like uh, we were dancing and having fun and everyone was joining into that vibe. Uh, and uh, some other scenes I used, um, I can't pronounce that song, but it's actually from the opening of uh, Antichrist, uh, the, the um, prologue there. It's an opera that I always get really sad <laughs> listening to. So I had those two a lot, listening to those a lot. You mentioned the uh, the wedding scene, which is you know one of the one of the great flirtation scenes in in, in modern movies. Can you talk about um, how that came about and what it was like to film? Me or Joachim? Oh, both of you. Yeah, I mean, I can start with how it's written. I think it's one of the early ideas we had, uh, Eskil and I, was this just the concept that uh, we we all know that monogamy is an ideal we all want to experience it's the it's the wonderful joy of being in a relationship and, and you know uh, being honest to that at the same time our instincts as human beings can lead us other places and so i thought wouldn't it be fun to have like a romantic scene that that in a meta way kind of discusses that between two characters who decide like we, we can't cheat but you know what what is intimacy which leads into the story, discussing what is real intimacy. Is it actually the sex or is it perhaps sharing something very secret, smelling each other? I mean, all these things that are actually <laughs> equally intimate and therefore maybe also they are cheating or aren't they? You know, I wanted the audience to engage in that conversation and in that kind of uh, theme. 
Granada did, what was it like to film? Is it, is it the kind of thing where you kind of let yourself go a little bit? Do you have to work things out yeah. with um <laughs> with It was amazing. Fellow? Yeah. <laughs> no, it was amazing. It was um it was, you know, when you go into something like flirting or trying to be your best self, I for me, I always bring in also like the stuff I don't like about myself and the shame and being embarrassed and uh because you're a whole person, you know. So it uh and I Joachim also urged us very much to be as open and honest as we could about all these things. So um it was uh, very uh, scary and funny to to act those scenes. And uh, Harbert Nordrum, who plays uh, Ivan, he is so generous. He still feels like he did better work off camera than he did, did on camera because he wants to give the other actors so much. So he it was uh, really easy to get into that, uh, you know, the sparks flying and everything because of him. So no, it was great. You know, a scene like that is so indicative of like what what movies can do in terms of intimacy. And I know Renate, you come from the theater, so can you talk about that kind of like shifting from from what it's you know acting on stage and what that requires to having a camera right there? Uh, you know, was that a hard transition? Was it a fun transition? What? I think I've done like a little bit uh, here and there with movies in TV, so I wasn't scared of the camera. Uh, but I guess I try to relate to the camera with Kasper Tuxen also as the cinematographer. He's amazing. He brings uh, such a great energy. He is an amazing person. So we really felt like a good collaboration there. And uh, But just, um, I don't know, this is kind of the same way feeling the audience on the other side, uh, like you do. You get it, of course, in the theater, you get an immediate response and you don't do that, except you could hear Joachim laughing <laughs> in the background a lot. <laughs> and <laughs> so... Uh, I ruin takes. It's terrible. No, it's, no, the, we have to sit in sound and edit me out. It's terrible. No, it's really good. But it's... Uh, I feel a lot of productions I've been in have... Like, it's never been like this. Joachim really has a special way of working and it's so collective and it's... Uh, we really, like bound together everyone and everyone is really ambitious but so free with Joachim's way of working so uh, that's kind of I can compare that to the theater where you uh, have to work together and do all the stuff in front of the audience you know so it uh, and I really really enjoy that so um, yeah Joachim is amazing <laughs> thank you yeah. so are you it's it's fun to work together and I, I think that's that's the primary thing of casting I often tell people like when you cast a film I always need to meet the actors and 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 get to know them a little bit you know like because it's not just me casting someone we're casting can we talk and trust each other and they need to feel that too you know it's not just one way as director you're <laughs> supposed to be the one that chooses but there needs to be some sense of a collaborative possibility. I think that's very important. And I, I know that with Renata, that uh, we can have fun and, and challenge each other and do some good work together. You know, and We're talking about that for the future too. I, I'd love to do more work with Renata and I'm sure she's gonna fly off in the world and get all these wonderful parts which she deserves. But you know, I hope she, uh, she'll come back down and visit me once in a while and we can make some movies. Of course, of course. Well, it certainly feels like you could revisit Julie at some point, right? Julie, yeah, 20 I, years I, later. Yeah, I really, really love that character. And it was so sad to leave her. But now traveling with this movie for now, actually eight months, has been really great to just be in these conversations a little bit longer. What are some of your favorite reactions you're hearing from people about this movie? Because it, it must spark many different kinds of reactions. Yeah. Yeah. It it really does. Uh, so many different people have a really. Did you uh, have a person. good one from your grandmother? Oh yeah, my grandmother. She is uh, about the sex or the. <laughs> <laughs> no, she had um. She was she was very scared to see the sex, but it was. She said it was uh, livable. Uh, <laughs> she could. It was okay. No, but she she feels like she uh, is Julie, and she's eighty four maybe now I'm 85 and she has you know she changes her job all the time she has a new biker dude boyfriend and uh, uh she says like she really feels like julie so i i feel like all ages 
uh, genders uh, are connecting to the script and the movie. I always find um, it intriguing because you don't, you know, we, we when the poster is hanging in the streets and the film is in the theaters, everyone thinks that the people behind the film had this specific idea about what they were doing. And we do, but it changes. And you don't really know what it is until it's the audience's movie. You know, like now, it's out there. I, I Now I get the feedback. Now I'm learning what we really did or what people are feeling from the film. And, and I think a lot of uh, identification, people that are identifying with the, the, like the subject matter of identity and the pressure of representing yourself. Like we're, we're playing around with a character, of, like Julie is this kind of a chameleon in the, at the beginning of the film. And she's trying on different hairstyles and ways of being and professions. But as it turns out, it becomes very painful and, and quite serious for her to feel this pressure to become something successful as if the whole idea of the meritocratic society of self-representation is getting the better of her. And that pain, um, and hopefully the hopefulness at the end of that rather sad journey that she goes on after a while in the film there, it seems like people are identifying with that. And that's a great thing. You know, We thought we were starting to make a film about love and loss, but it's the idea of identity seems to be popping up a lot in what people are appreciating about the film. So that's, that's lovely to, to it's, it's, we're discovering it still, I think. It, it also seems like a. Uh, it, it also seems like a movie that it, it made me realize how not very um, effective the term "coming of age" is. I mean, because I feel like you can come of age at any time in life. I mean, there, there, yeah. that, that that seems. And even though, yeah, I, I don't know. Was that something you guys thought about too? Yeah, we talked about we're, that we were making a film coming of age for grown-ups, and that you know, twenty years ago, a coming of age film would be about someone turning twenty or. 22 perhaps at, 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 at oldest but uh, now making turning 30 could be equally coming of agey you know like <laughs> I don't know whether it is because we are growing up later or it's because we are discovering that growing up is not something that actually happens it's 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 a it's a it's an illusion <laughs> we keep hopefully or you know developing but but i do feel that julie as a character is throughout the film learning something she is taking responsibility for her choices and is realizing that not all doors are open you know but it's also the issue of freedom what what is freedom like when you're very young you think freedom is to choose to be able to choose anything and when you're older maybe freedom is allowing yourself to be good enough and to accept yourself. And that makes you feel freer. So yeah, it's a, it's a journey about those, those things, I think. Renati, what, is, what was the uh, hardest scene for you to, to make in the film? The hardest thing? Yeah, what was the hardest scene the to hardest shoot scene. for you? Um, that's a good question. That's a good question. I, I feel like every single day we went off set, we felt like, okay, we we found something. Uh, and sometimes we wouldn't really know what we made or why it felt right or why we uh, were moved by something. And I I don't know, it's, it's that balance between uh, that you have in real life, like small things can mean so much. Like in the small, smallest thing in life can be, forever changing you or uh, changing the course of your whole life. And um, like talking about these themes, you can't always have full control. You have to just let things happen. And um, I don't know, the hardest ones were, we had like, we needed to go, uh, the, the scene where Julie goes from the restaurant where she's been with Axel and down to the wedding scene, we we wanted to play around with how much emotion she could go through and how many shifts, uh, mm -hmm. just to make it as complex and uh, complicated as possible. And I was uh, a bit scared of doing that because I really wanted uh, wanted it to work and it was really hard. But um, we, it was a good version that we did from from that day. Yeah. Yeah. Your your tears walking through the city uh, in that scene are are, are really. Mm -hmm powerful and especially because you may not you know necessarily know what she's thinking you just know that she's going through something um, yeah can, can you talk about 
Oslo as a place where you can kind of walk around and, and feel things? And it, is that one of the things the movie wants to kind of convey is what it, what you can go through just walking through a city? Yeah, yeah. I, I think yeah. so. Like, what did you feel about doing those scenes, Jonathan? Like, because when you no, did walk was, around, we did follow you. Yeah, it's, uh, I, when I, like, playing in the movie and seeing the movie is two totally different things. And seeing the movie, I felt that I could, like, the city was it, its own character almost, that I could, like, rest uh, with Julie and rest with the characters through the city and through just looking at the city. And that's what Julie does, too. She, um... She sees the city and she, it hits her, like, where am I in my life and what am I doing and am I doing the right things? Am I with the right person? And all these, like, big existential questions hits her from watching from above where she lives down there. So it was a, it, it plays an, a, a very important part in the movie and, and for me as an actress too. Um, a question I like to ask um, filmmakers, uh, uh, what did you feel like you learned about what you do from making this movie? And I, and I mean, you know, I mean, both of you, you and Kim and, and Renate, what did you, you know, you I always mean, assume you mean you almost like something. in a craft sense? Like, well, I mean, like, I feel like, I always feel like when you, that every time you do something, you kind of learn a little bit more about what you do. Like, and I'm, and I'm wondering if that was the case here. I think that doing this film for me was about re-engaging with a kind of, the fun of making films in a kind of risk-taking sense. And I think I learned from the film that it's okay to work in a more messy way. I mean, to be quite honest, I control things a lot. I'm a planner. I am very meticulous about it. I, I go with my first AD and my whole cam the camera team, and we, we've actually planned out all the shots prior to shooting and a lot of work like that. But really letting go more than any other film I've, I've done has been really... Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful that that turned out with, with, with this film and that people are appreciating it, uh, you know. Um, I, try, I try to show off less than ever and still people are enjoying it. So I think there's a sense of self pretend like confidence or something, but I, I'm learning more to relax about what I'm doing, I think, and uh, to trust the material. Renate, what, what about you? I, I know yeah. you considered maybe not, you maybe considered quitting acting before this. So I'm wondering if this is a role that kind of helped you stay in acting. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> oh yeah. 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 I, I, uh, I was very frustrated about how things were produced and how little time uh, there was for um, actually the craft and, and like talking about human existence and exploring that. But this movie is, of course, the opposite and like everything I would ever dream to be in. But I, I learned so much. I feel I learned a new way of acting through this, through you, Akim, also, because he urged me so much to let go. And also, um, he is so confident. He's confident enough to uh, that he doesn't need me to show what I'm feeling or show him what I'm going through. I just needed to go through it and be there and that would be enough because he is very um sensitive is the wrong word like uh what's the word you are kim <laughs> uh, i don't know <laughs> yeah but but you are you are i think uh, i'll take sensitive aware. i'll take sensitive it's okay, something okay, that yeah. i will you okay know, will get that you get it. Achieve, but yes. i know there's a better word but I'll, I'll just say it now to move on but um so uh so that you you really see you can really see Everyone in the uh, crew as well, but you also see every step that um, you don't only see what we do and what you uh, what you actually see, but you see where it comes from too. So as an actor, you feel really, really safe because you're always taken care of and you can actually talk on a much deeper level about what's going on. Um, so I, I could, uh, oh, I'm getting a word here, perceptive, yes. I'm, it, someone wrote to me perceptive. <laughs> That's what you want. That's, That's um, a big compliment. To whoever wrote that behind your camera there, thank you. That's, that's lovely. It was Mr. Perceptive. Boss. No, but, but, but it is about, I mean, this is what we're nourishing when we work in, with movies is uh, observation and perceptiveness. I, you know, it's what we try to achieve every day and not all days are great, but at our best, I think the, um, to sit 
almost like a therapist sit next to the camera and think what is really going on it's very easy to fool yourself as a filmmaker and think that oh i've told everyone this is what we're doing we all believe we're doing it but it's like cut all the crap like looking at the actors like what is really going on you might be getting something quite unexpected that could be used in a more interesting way and I think that's exciting about having people like Renata and Anderson and Herbert and the other actors is that they are quite brave about they kind of they try to be a part of the project and within the alliance of what I've set out with the script but they also break the rules and take risks and I try to encourage it as much as I can because it's my responsibility to tell the story, not the, theirs. I, we try to, I mean, you know, okay, mm. here's a different way of putting it. I used to skateboard when I was young. I was like Norwegian champion of skateboarding and I used to film my friends skateboarding. I made skate videos and they became quite pro, kind of underground popular uh, back in the 90s. And I realized that it was about creating an event like something crazy would happen. Someone would jump out a staircase and maybe they would fall on their ass or they would land a difficult trick. And it was equally interesting. Some unique event, like the uniqueness of the moment was the energy of the shot. And I think that I still try to encourage the actors to like, if something strange happens, go with it. It might lead us somewhere interesting. And then for me to try to, to observe it. And then, you know, it's the wonderful thing in our day and age where we look at our phone every three minutes to be allowed to be in that zone of flow with actors and just sit there for hours and look at what they do and feel them and try to figure out how to help them do interesting stuff. That's the kick. I think that's the kick for me to in making movies. Again, what, like my previous film, Thelma, was a supernatural thriller and I enjoyed that and it's full of drama. And I really think Eileen Harbo, who plays Thelma is a remarkably talented actor. Um, but around that, there was also 200 CGI shots. And I do enjoy the sort of Hitchcock-esque meticulousness of filmmaking. But I, I, with this one, I wanted to center even more on, on what, what, the chaos of performance and character. And I think that was kind of what we, we were working on with this one. I'm getting the impression that uh, skateboarding is behind the uh, time stoppage shot. Like that there's a sense of like what that must feel like to be on a skateboard going through people. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking that maybe that there's a little bit. Well, I couldn't, I can't think of a a better way to, to, to end this uh, on how on talking about the extreme social intelligence of this movie. So thank you to uh, both uh, Joachim and Renate for joining us to talk about uh, the worst person in the world, and, and share some of the thoughts and experiences of making this movie. Um, so, yeah, Thanks thank, for thank, and then thank you. Of course, uh, thank you, Robert. Thank you to everyone. It's good talking to you. It was nice talking to you too, and and then thank you to all all of you out there for for uh, joining us for this edition of the Envelope Live Screening Series. So we hope to see you again soon.